Good morning. It's great to hear all the talking that's going on, the fellowship this morning uh, on this beautiful Lord's Day that uh, we have to come together to worship our Heavenly Father. It's good to see everyone. It's good to see our members. It's good to see uh, uh, visitors that we have today. Uh, we're excited that you came our way today and invite you to come back at any opportunity that you may have. Uh, if you would, if you're visiting, if you would fill out a visitor's card, uh, there's some at the uh, end chairs, and uh, if you're one of our members and you see a visitor, uh, pass them a card, and just place that in the uh, uh, collection uh, baskets whenever you uh, uh, leave this morning. But it is good to see everyone. If you would be turning to <clears throat> Luke chapter 7, verses 40 through 43, Luke Chapter 7, verses 40 through 43 will be our scripture reading in preparation for our Brother Harper's lesson this morning. Prior to that, uh, let me uh, make a, a few announcements, and uh, uh, it is quite lengthy this morning. Uh, the youth dinner in Devo is tonight at the home of Keith and Margaret Short, immediately following PM services. A senior saint's dinner is planned for Saturday April the 9th at 5 o'clock. This is for ages 50 and up this time. Uh, and you can come and learn more about uh, Social Security and the deadline for signing up for that catered meal is tonight. So if you plan on coming for, especially for the dinner, uh, uh, we need to get a number for the catered meal. Uh, and uh, that will be, uh, Demas is, is catering that. There'll be an entree, salad, din uh, dessert, and drink. And the cost per person is $10, so pretty good deal there. So uh, please pay at the event uh, Saturday night. All of December 20, uh, 2021 and May 2022 graduates, uh, please uh, let Cindy Pfeiffer know you are graduating so that we may honor you on May 15th. April's journey home drive is for detergent pods and travel size toiletries, and please drop that off by April the 10th. There will be a VBS meeting in the large classroom on April 10th at 430 for all teachers and workers. Uh, Jake Schottner will be our guest speaker for the PM service on April the 10th. Uh, Jake is uh, one of our preacher scholarship recipients. Uh, Bible Bros will meet April the 14th at Toots West at 6 p.m. There will be an Easter egg hunt at the home of John and Judy Holland on April the 16th at 2 o'clock uh, in the afternoon. Please sign up in the foyer. Uh, if you can provide candy, filled eggs, and please drop those off by April the 13th. Our college and youth adult Devo for April the 22nd at 7 p.m. at the building. Uh, a bridal shower is planned for Kirsten and Eddie, Kirsten, Eddie, and Cody Pepper on April the 24th uh, here at the building from 1.30 until 3. They are registered at Target. Uh, also, uh, Nancy Benson is now at uh, the Tennessee Veterans Home. Um, Luke chapter 7, verses 40 through 43. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who he, for, he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity this morning to gather together to, to worship you, to sing praises to you, to come to you through this avenue of prayer and to study from your inspired word. Father, we're so thankful for the congregation of your people here at Salem Creek and ask that you continue to bless us in our efforts here. Be with congregations of your people throughout this world. Be with them today and, and those, uh, some of those are, are persecuted and, and have difficulties in worshiping you. 
but be with them and give them strength and courage and, and that they may be bold in the face of adversity. Father, we thank you for uh, each family here. Continue to bless them. Father, we pray that everything we do here uh, this morning will be according to your will, and especially for your glory. These things we pray in your name. Amen. Uh, Brother Jim will now come and lead us in our singing. First song this morning will be song number 660. Let's stand, if you would please. There is a habitation. There is a Song number 641, The Lord's My Shepherd.
faithful love. with me from everlasting to everlasting thou art God our Heavenly Father we approach thy throne this morning as humble servants in your kingdom and we're thankful for this day that you've given us a day that we've never seen before and a day that we'll never see again dear father we thank you for the changing of the seasons we thank you for all the wonderful blessings that you have given us from the early existence of our lives down to this present time. We thank you for this gathering on this morning, a gathering that we don't take for granted, an opportunity that we have to approach you in worship and in praise and in songs and in hymns and in spiritual songs. We thank you for the opportunity of being recipients of your word, that we pray that when thy word is preached unto us, that we'll have open hearts and receptive minds to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. Dear Father, we ask special prayers for our country that when decisions are made, that they'll be always be made with you in mind and not be made selfishly. Dear Father, we ask a special prayer for this congregation, those that are sick, those that are hurting, those that have lost loved ones. We pray that you would comfort them during their hour of time and sorrow. We pray for the leadership of this congregation. We pray for Brother Josh and Brother Ron as they stand before us Sunday after Sunday, proclaiming the unsearchable riches of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that, that you will be with Brother Ron on this morning as he stands before us, that the things that he has to say that will sink deep into our hearts and that will cause us to be better soldiers of the cross in the future than we've been in the past. As we end this prayer, we want to thank you for Jesus, the head of the church, the savior of the world, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Sing Psalm 19. Song taken, of course, directly from Psalms 19, talking about the law of the Lord is sweeter than honey. Mm -hmm. 
in your songbooks and want to mark the song of invitation, number 655, number 655, and then before the lesson, number 717, victory in Jesus. Let's stand if you would again.
Brother Jim, I got to say, I envy him because he's able to get up here and lead that singing. And your singing today has been amazing as an offering of worship and praise to our Heavenly Father. It is uh, good to see Jim back up here leading singing on Sunday morning after a little bit of an absence following his surgery. And I want to say that everybody who filled in on that Sunday, mon Sunday morning role did a tremendous job. And we thank you for using your talents to lead God's people in worship. We have a full house today. Thank you for being here. We have several visitors to all of you. We say welcome. We also say come back. Worship with us every time you have the opportunity. And if you were looking for a church home, I really want to have a conversation with you about this great church here at Salem Creek. Open your Bible with me to the seventh chapter of Luke's Gospel. I'm not going to apologize for reading a fairly lengthy reading this morning in the beginning. What Brother Keith read is just a part of what we're going to be looking at. So let's go to verse 36 of Luke chapter 7. Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. There was a woman in the city who was a sinner. When she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with, her, with the hair of her head, kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who was touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He replied, say it, teacher. The money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. He said to him, you've judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but since the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time she came in. She's not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my feet with oil. She anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. In our very first full-time work with a congregation like this, we had our very first um, revival meeting with that congregation, a guest preacher coming in to hold the week's meeting. And the preacher was uh, Brother Woodrow Smith. There's only time in my life I ever was around Brother Smith was that one week when he was with us in uh, Carbon Hill, Alabama. He was preaching in a small town called Jackson, Alabama at the time. During his time with us, well, we got to know him a pretty good bit. I learned a lot of things in my early days of preaching the gospel. One of the things I learned right out of the starting gate at Carbon Hill was that when they had a preacher in for a meeting, he stayed with the local preacher. I learned that a few weeks before Brother Smith was coming. 
that Janie and I were going to be keeping him that week in that meeting, keeping him in our house as a guest. And so uh, we had to house him, we had to feed him, and none of that was a burden. It was all a joy to us to be able to spend that time with him. When he was there, he told me a story. It was the first time in my life I had ever, had ever heard anything like it. Since then, I've heard similar stories on numerous occasions. Prior to becoming a member of the Lord's Church, he had been a member of a certain denomination that went about things in a way that would be typical of a number of different religious groups. When somebody wanted to be a member of that church, the congregation had to take a vote to decide whether or not they would be admitted as a member in good standing of that congregation. One night during a revival meeting, there was a man who responded to the invitation as it was offered in that church. And this man had what we might describe as a seedy reputation. He had been a taxi driver, was a taxi driver in that town. And, and that's not a profession that is normally going to earn you a bad reputation. But in his work as a taxi driver, he very frequently would carry the local prostitutes on their business calls to their clients. And, and as a result of that, he developed a very bad name in that town. Well, he came down the aisle during the, uh, the invitation one night in that revival service. Uh, they considered that he had been saved from his sins. But then sometime later when it came time to take a vote on him, whether or not he would be admitted as a member of that congregation, there were a number of people who cast a negative vote. They said, we don't want him as a member here. And that excluded him from membership in that local group. The question was asked to some of them, why have you voted against his being a member in this group? And they said, well, because of his reputation, the things that he has done. Brother Woodrow went to see the preacher of that congregation right after that took place. And he was asking about them. There, there was something to him that seemed wrong about that, even in his limited understanding of Scripture. And he asked the preacher, do you believe that this man was saved from sin? Oh, yes, there's no question that he was saved from sin. So in other words, you're telling me he's good enough for the kingdom of heaven, but he's not good enough to be a member of this elite silk stocking group here. And the preacher didn't really have an answer for that other than to hang his head. And that was one of the first steps along the way in, in Brother Smith coming to an understanding of what New Testament Christianity is all about. Imagine, if you will, that there are some people who look at other people in their desire to be a part of a faith community and would say to them, you are not good enough to be a part of this group. Your reputation would exclude you from being a part of this group. And that is exactly the opposite of what ought to happen, exactly the opposite of what happens under the gospel of Jesus Christ and by the saving grace of God. And so if anybody is good enough to be in the kingdom of heaven, are they not good enough to be among us? And that's a question that we ought to ask, and it's a question that we ought to answer honestly. We're going to take a look at this text this morning. In Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50, we're going to analyze it, I think, in a very simple way. But I'm probably going to violate every homiletical rule known to preacher students in the way that I approach this because we're going to start right here in the middle of this text in verses 40 through 43. And as we look at these few verses for just a moment, I want you to think with me, if you will, about the two debtors. Let's go back to that text. Jesus replies to Simon by saying, I've got something to say to you. And so Simon says, okay, teacher, what is it? Well, there was a moneylender who had two debtors. 
one owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. Now, which of them do you think will love the more? Simon's reply makes a lot of sense to us, and Jesus says, you've answered that correctly. It's the one who has been forgiven the most. Here is a money lender, a creditor who had two debtors, two people who owed him money. What is a debtor? A debtor is exactly what the name implies. A debtor is somebody who owes money to somebody else. There are two of them here, and their circumstances, though dissimilar, they are also very similar. How are they dissimilar? Well, one owed 500 denarii. How much money would that be? I could not give you a figure in dollars and cents according to what our currency is worth in the year 2022, but I'm told by Bible scholars whose works I have read that it would be something like one and a half years wages. He owes the creditor. He owes the loan shark a year and a half worth of his wages. The other simply owed 50 denarii. And how much is 50 denarii? Well, I am told that 50 denarii is something like two months' pay in the Bible times. And by the way, here's the way that it worked. One denarius is about what somebody got paid for working in the field for one day. And there are several stories in the Gospels about people who went out to work a day in the field. At the end of the day, you would get paid. You got paid on a daily basis. The typical wage for the day laborer like that was one denarius. Here's one who owes 500, something like a year and a half's wages, I am told. The other simply owes 50. That's two months' pay. And so you ask the question, it's similar to the one that Jesus asked, who was the one who, who loved the most? The question I would ask this morning, which of these two was in the worst position? Most of you are going to say the one who owed the most. Now when Jesus says you've told the truth when he said the one who's forgiven more, I don't really believe that is to be taken as the end of that particular story. Hear what I'm about to say. And in no sense of the word is this intended to contradict anything that Jesus said. I think we fully need to understand what he said. Which one of these two men owed the most? Which was in the worst position? And you say the one that owed the most. And I would agree with you, but I would ask a follow-up question. Is that all the truth? Here is the truth about debt. Well, I'm fixing to run headlong into the truth about debt because um, through some circumstances that some of you know and others may not be aware of, I'm in a position of having to buy an automobile. And I'm going to buy an automobile fairly soon, even though I have two vehicles. We got the Grammy wagon, the Chevy Tahoe, and, and I've got my old pickup truck, affectionately known as Rooster. Why I'm going to go out fairly soon and buy another vehicle is I'm having to fill the tank of rooster about every other day or every two or three days. If if you check the price of gasoline at the pump lately, you know what that is. Now, rooster loves gasoline. And there is no such thing as cheap gasoline anymore. So, I'm going to be buying an automobile fairly soon that gets a whole lot better gas mileage than my wonderful Ford F-150 pickup truck. I've got to be careful. We got one car loan we're fixing to get rid of, but then I'm going to have to go around and to somewhere and take out another car loan. Do I buy this really expensive automobile and wind up with a $400 a month car payment? Or do I buy a lesser automobile and wind up with a $200 a month car payment? It is just against my religion, every fiber of my being to have a $400 a month car payment. And some of you are 
chuckling inside, laughing at my thinking about that. I can't do it. You pay that much for it, really there ought to be a basement under it. If I borrow something that's going to require repaying at the tune of $400 a month, or I borrow something that's going to require repaying at the tune of $200 a month, in either case, what am I? You thought about that? In either case, what am I? In either case, I am a debtor. I'm a debtor. I owe somebody money. If I default on $200 a month car payment, whatever that final amount might be, or I default on a, a, a car loan whose, whose terms demand that I pay $400 a month, I have defaulted either way, have I not? Whichever amount I borrow, I am in debt. If I cannot repay the larger loan, or I cannot repay the smaller loan, I'm basically in the same situation, am I not? I'm basically in a hopeless position. So when you look at these two debtors that are a part of the story that Jesus tells, try to remember that debt is debt. Whether I owe you $100 or $1,000, I am in debt to you. And there is something said in verse 42 that we need to be sure that we understand. Jesus said, when they were unable to repay. It's easy to understand the hopeless position of debtor number one who owes a year and a half worth of wages. What is he going to do? How many of you could afford to work the next year and a half and not receive a penny for your work? There may be one or two of us who could. I couldn't. And I don't think there are very many of us that could. Consider debtor number two. Think about the debt that he owes. What is he going to do? Two months pay. I mean, remember, he's a day laborer. He only gets paid on the day that he works. He gets paid at the end of the day. But the Bible also says of him that he could not pay. And so it's going to take two months to pay off that debt. You can imagine if you figure two months being one month with 30 days, another being 31, there's 61 days. If you take out the eight Sabbaths that would fall during that two-month period of time, if I have added correctly, there are 53 days left in which he could work. He goes to work day after day after day. At the end of the day, when he got his coin, that lowly denarius, he had to go to the creditor and give it to him. But hang on a minute. What's he going to do? He's got a family at home to feed. How does he do that? Did they have those little street corner payday loan places in the New Testament world? I don't think so. Did he find some place to borrow more money to buy food and to go deeper in debt? In the words of Tennessee Ernie Ford, song another day older and, and deeper in debt. You want to say like Simon did. The one who owed the most is the one that's going to love the most. And Jesus said you've answered correctly. But that doesn't really tell the whole story. Both of those two were in debt. Both of those two were in a very bad spot. Two debtors. Think with me now just a moment about two sinners. In the first place there is sinner number one. Let's call her sinner number one, the woman. There was a woman in the city who was a sinner. Luke chapter 7 verse 37. And you can interpret that word sinner 
in a whole lot of different ways. It is a very broad designation. And by the way, I also read that there were a number of occupations in the New Testament world for Jewish people that if you engage in those occupations, you became an unclean person in a ceremonial sense, and thus you could legitimately be designated a sinner. Other people say, well, when you talk about the sinner here, that's telling us that she was a prostitute. I tend to think that that is the case, and I'll tell you why. In talking about her, Jesus refers to her sins, which are many. I think it's used there in a moral sense in verse 47. In the Gospel of Luke, there are several occasions where we encounter what I would refer to as the spiritual caste system. My first college roommate was a young man from India. In India for a long time there has existed a caste system. At the lowest end of the spectrum there are what is known as the untouchables. I asked him what caste system his family was in. He said we are of the merchant caste. We're not the highest on the totem pole nor are we the least. You can find as you read through for example the Gospel of Luke Then in the minds of some people, a spiritual caste system existed. Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 1 and verse 2. The tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to him to listen to him. The Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. In Luke chapter 18, in verse 9, Jesus tells a story. He tells a parable to people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed other people with contempt. And then he told what you know very well is the parable of uh, the two men who went up to the temple to pray, one being a Pharisee, the other a publican. And from the time we were little children in Sunday school or vacation Bible school, we have heard the story of Zacchaeus, the wee little man who climbed up in a sycamore tree, the Savior for to see it as Jesus walked that way. He looked up in that tree and he said, and at that point the little kids singing the song just shout at the top of their lungs, you come down from there for I'm going to your house today. But in verse 7 of Luke chapter 19, he went home with Zacchaeus, Jesus did, and when people saw it, they all began to grumble saying, he's going to be the guest of a man who was a sinner. You can try to convince me that this spiritual caste system did not exist in the New Testament world in Judaism. You will not be successful. There was a woman, I believe most likely a prostitute. She is recognized by everybody in the house as being a sinner. In fact, the way the story unfolds, she is introduced in such a way that lets us know that everybody in the house knew what she was. Then on the other hand, there's a Pharisee, verse 36. Along with others, verse 49, who were also in the house, they had their questions also. Go back and read verse 49. Verse 40, this man's name was Simon. You could say there's a lot of good about Simon. Verse 36, he invited Jesus to come to his house to eat. Why did he invite Jesus? Some people might be tempted to say that he invited Jesus because, hey, he knows that Jesus is the prophet. He knows he's the son of God, and so he wants him to come to his house. And he does acknowledge him, according to verse 40, as teacher. Go back and read verse 40. Jesus often taught in synagogues as well as in the open Earlier in this chapter, in verse 16, after he has raised a young man from the dead, brought him back to life, there were people who were saying of Jesus, a great great prophet is among us. Had Simon heard that? Was Simon curious about that? There's Simon. There is the second sinner in the story. But I want you to understand as you listen to this story, as you read it, The woman was not the only sinner in the house. She's not the only sinner in the house. What does the Bible say about all of us? 
What does the Bible say about you? And what does the Bible say about me? Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 tells us the truth. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Two debtors, two sinners, two reactions to Jesus. If you go to verse 38, here is this woman standing behind him at his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears, and she kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. And verse 37 tells us about this woman in the city. She was a sinner. When she learned that Jesus was there, he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house. She comes with her expensive alabaster vial of perfume. There is her reaction to Jesus. Again, is she a prostitute? No doubt she was. I have no doubt that she was. Where did she get the money to buy that perfume? Think about that. Where did she get the money to buy that perfume? Did she get it from her earnings? Did she went about her business in the world's oldest profession? You understand, according to the law of Moses, a financial contribution from that woman from money that she had earned in her trade, would not be accepted at the house of the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 18, you cannot bring the wages of a prostitute or the hire of a dog into the house of the Lord. The hire of a dog, dog is a euphemism there for a male who works in that profession. If you make your money that way, you cannot bring it to the house of the Lord and give it as a donation there. She knew who Jesus was. She was able to go to that dinner party and pick him out of all the guests. Had she heard that he actually touches lepers? Go back and read Luke chapter 5 and verse 13. And by the way, what happens to you if you're Jewish living in the biblical world? If you touch a leper, you immediately become unclean. You allow a sinful woman like that to touch you, what happens to you in a ceremonial sense? You immediately become unclean. Had she heard that Jesus allows lepers to touch him and that he in turn touches them? Had she heard him preach the gospel? Mark 1 and verse 15, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel and that's the message that Jesus preached. And when you go to John chapter 3 and verse 22, John chapter 4 and verse 1, you're going to learn that John the Baptist is not the only one going around baptizing people. Jesus also was doing it. And in fact, he was baptizing more people than John was, according to John chapter 4 and verse 1. Had she heard all of that? She knew something about Jesus. And so she broke every social custom known to man in the biblical world of the first century. And she came to love Jesus. She crashed the party. She let her hair down. By the way, there's another little detail right there to think about. Here's this woman who is known as a sinner. She comes in to this room, probably a lot more males and females in the room, and she lets her hair down. Do you know what she has just advertised herself as being in that particular act? She breaks every social custom known to her world to come in and to love and adore Jesus. And look at the fuss that she made about him. And then there's Simon and his reaction to Jesus. And by the way, if you think about Simon and you think about Jesus and you think about this woman, verse 38 tells us that where he is at is to say, I've seen all I need to see. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. He can't possibly be a prophet. And remember the reaction after he has raised this young man from the dead back in the early part of Luke chapter 7. A great prophet is among us. 
By the way, there is at least one very ancient manuscript who, which at this particular point inserts the article the, the prophet, Luke chapter 7, verse 39. And that's probably not the preferred translation. But if it were, that would have Simon saying he can't possibly be the Christ. That would be interesting. I just don't believe that's the best possible translation there. I don't believe that belongs in the text. He sees what's going on. He knows all the commotion about Jesus. He sees this woman touching him in this ostentatious way. Never does Jesus do anything to discourage it. <laughs> this man were a prophet. He would know who and what sort of person this woman is who was touching him. She's a sinner. And is it implied there, if he really were a prophet, he wouldn't be letting her touch him and make him unclean. You see, a lot of people judge Jesus by the company that he kept, didn't they? And that's for us a very good thing. To know that Jesus would sit down with tax collectors, that he would sit down with sinners, that he would dine with them, that he would have fellowship with them, that they were welcome to be around him. Man, that just gives me a whole lot of comfort and a whole lot of good news. Because that lets me know that I am welcome to Jesus. But you think about Simon and what he is known for is his neglect of Jesus. And imagine, if you will, in verse 39... The Pharisee who invited him, that Simon, he sees all of this going on and he's saying it to himself. What does that mean? He's thinking that. To think something in the presence of Jesus, you may have just as well been shouting it from the housetop because he knows your thoughts. Sometime back, it's been three, four years ago, Sister Cindy and I and Joshua, maybe Kayla was there. I think Kaylee was there also. It was, I think it was Cindy's birthday. We're at Longhorn celebrating that birthday. And, and I wanted to pay the tab. I wanted to treat everybody to lunch. And so I thought I was whispering to the waiter, bring me the check. But you know this little problem I have, hearing and I have to keep asking you to repeat things. And about the third time I ask you to repeat it, I just smile and say, oh, yes. And I still don't have a clue what you've said. I can't hear myself talking half the time. And evidently, it must have sounded like, please bring me the check. Because Brother Joshua looked at me and he said, we're hearing every word you say. You remember that? Better watch what you think in the presence of Jesus. He thought he said it to himself. The Lord of heaven heard it. And then he told the story. And then he told about this woman of what she had done for him. And what she'd really done for him was a rebuke of Simon. If you go back and read this. Since I entered your house, you didn't give me any water for my feet. She's wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but since the time I came in, she hasn't stopped kissing my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil. She's been anointing my head with perfume. When you went to see somebody, you were a guest at their place, they would typically do three things. They'd give you water to wash your feet. They would greet you with a kiss. Not an unholy thing. It was a form of greeting. And in a lot of cases, they would put some kind of something on you to enhance the smell. Simon hadn't done any of that for Jesus. And that's what you would typically do for a guest who came to your house. What does it say about his attitude toward Jesus? That he did not comply with a single one of the standard social customs, the common courtesies that would be extended to any guest at your house. There are two debtors, there are two sinners, and there are two applications of what goes on here. Think about the two debtors in the house. The difference may be superficial. Well, there's a difference in the amount. 
I go to the mailbox just about every day thinking that if I go fearing there's a letter from Internal Revenue, there won't be one. But sometimes there is. It, it doesn't matter if that letter tells me I owe them $2,000 or if it tells, them, tells me I owe them $20,000. I am still the debtor with a debt that is an unpayable debt. Let me ask you a couple of questions and we'll close. How many sins does it take for me to be a sinner? How many sins does it take for you to be a sinner? And is there any way out of that debt without the grace of Christ? There were two debtors who represented two people in that house. One knew full well that they were lost, that they had been lost. They'd been lifted out of that by the grace of Christ. The other didn't have a clue. And right there is why some people don't come to Jesus today. And we have people here today who need to come to Christ, and you haven't come to Christ. And I wonder if part of the reason is that we preachers have just kind of been missing it in recent years by not saying an awful lot about being lost and what it means to be lost. If you are not in Christ, you are eternally lost. What happens if you die in that condition? You owe an unpayable debt, no matter how nice a fellow you are. That debt can only be paid by Christ. Today, if you need to be baptized into Christ, I ask you to consider the fact you may not think your debt is as big a debt as the drunkard laying out here in the gutter, but you still owe a debt that you could never pay. And when you come to Christ and understand that that debt has been paid, that lady shows you how you're going to respond. What does it mean to be a debtor? Come and have that lifted in Jesus as we stand and sing. our thoughts now on the Lord's Supper. We'll sing 621.
fail to pick up one of the communion cups, if you will raise your hand at this time, someone will bring you one. Would you please bow as we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer? Our wise and ever-loving Heavenly Father, we come to thee in prayer this morning to give thee thanks for allowing us to see another beautiful Lord's Day come into existence. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity that we have as thy children to assemble and to remember thy son's death, burial, and resurrection upon the cross of Calvary. We pray, dear God, that each one who is about to partake of this loaf to the Christian through faith represents the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that each of us might reflect back upon Calvary and realize the pain and suffering that our Lord went through and partake of this bread in a way that will be pleasing unto thee. For we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Let us bow. Father, as we continue this memorial, we give thee thanks for the cup, the fruit of the vine, which the Christian through faith, dear God, represents the shed blood that our Lord shed upon Calvary's cross for the remission of our sins. Help us, dear God, to reflect back upon that event and to realize what a sad condition that lost humanity would be in without the shedding of his blood and that we may take this in a way that be pleasing unto thee for we ask this all in christ's name amen There are baskets at the rear of the auditorium. If you've not done so yet, you may uh, drop your collection in the baskets that's been provided as you exit. Let us pray. Father, we acknowledge thee as the giver and the sustainer of life itself. Father, we thank thee so much for the many blessings that thou hast showered upon us down to this present moment in time in our life. Would thou help us to never take such for granted, but thou might help us to always be good stewards in what thou has entrusted into our care. Dear God, we're thankful for the opportunity that we have to be able to return into thee a portion of that that thou so richly blessed us with. We pray, dear God, that the gift may be used to help spread the borders of thy kingdom and the giver might have an opportunity to give back unto thee once again. Father, we especially pray for those men who have the oversight of such funds that thou would be with them in the decisions that uh, they make and the distributions of these funds. For we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. mention again that it is good to have everyone here this morning if you're visiting with us again we invite you back anytime that you're able to be here before we're led in our closing prayer listening the first and last verses of 684 this world is not my home let's stand please this world is not my home
Shall we pray together? Dear Lord, we, we thank you for giving us this time that we've been able to come together this morning. We thank you for Ron and his lesson. We pray, Lord, that the things we've heard this morning will be able to apply to our lives as we go forward from this place into the world. We pray, Lord, that as we interact with people, whether it be work, school, or just on the street, that they'll notice something different about us. And that something different is you in our lives. Be with those who are not able to be here today for whatever reason. Give them the care that they need. We pray, Lord, that you'll continue to watch over us and guide us. It's in your Son, Christ's name we pray. Amen.
again. And so uh, I want us to open with prayer. And let's all, let's all bow together. Father, our hearts overflow with gratitude, with love, with praise as we stand in your presence today. Thank you for the privilege of worship and, Father, for the privilege of fellowship that is such an integral part of that worship. Thank you for kindred spirits, brothers and sisters who love you who share the same goals, who share the same destination, who face the same challenges. We pray that we'll lift one another up, that we will love and encourage one another. Thank you for the book of Galatians. Thank you so much that we are justified by faith in your Son, our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Good to see all of you here today. We're in Galatians chapter 4 this morning. We're going to try to move right into that. We had a great crowd today, 242. I did not anticipate that. We were down significantly last week, I'm convinced, because of a spring break. And this is the last weekend of the spring break week. I thought our numbers would still be down, but our numbers uh, were really, really good today. And, and it's a joy to see all of you. So we're going to be in Galatians chapter 4 verses 1 through 11 this morning and we're going to be talking about whether or not we are children, whether or not we're servants, what makes us uh, to be able to occupy such a wonderful position that we have. Starting in verse 1 we'll read the first 11 verses of Galatians 4. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. He is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, <clears throat> crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son, <clears throat> and if a son, then an heir of God. However, at that time, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how is it that you turn back to the weak and worthless elemental things to which you desire to be enslaved again? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. And so this is the text with which we're going to be concerned this morning. It seems that the Christians in Galatia had a hard time appreciating the freedom that they enjoyed in Christ. I think that sometimes that parallels our own experience. Though we're talking about two completely different situations, I don't know that any of us are trying to move back to the old covenant, to uh, a system whereby we had to offer animal sacrifices, where we had to uh, keep the Sabbath day and where circumcision was a part of the covenant. I don't know that any of us long to go back to something like that. I've never heard of that uh, among the Lord's people. And yet there is a similarity, I believe, sometimes in that we may have trouble appreciating the freedom that we enjoy in Christ. What makes you a Christian? The blood of Christ. What allows you to be in Him, to be right with God? Faith in Him. And that's expressed, Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27, as we 
uh, come to him in obedience to his gospel. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And so as a result of the faith of the gospel, through our faith in Christ Jesus, we're able to be sons and daughters of God. How many of us can pay for that with money? Not a one of us. How many of us could possibly earn us, earn that? Not a one of us. And God doesn't ask us to earn that. Do we merit it in any way? Absolutely none. We've been freed from all of that, the desire to or, or the, any kind of necessity about buying it with money, earning it through keeping some kind of perfect checklist, getting there by our own merit. We've been set free from all of that. But do we truly appreciate the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus? As we move through the book of Galatians, we'll come to chapter 5 where we'll learn about the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit, and we'll come to understand that if we have really been justified by faith and we truly appreciate the freedom that we have in Christ, that is not going to lead us to a life of self-indulgence and sin, but that's going to lead us to a life of walking by the Spirit of Christ so that the fruit of the Spirit is displayed in our lives. Do we appreciate the freedom that we have in Christ. Some of us don't. And that may be responsible for questions that we always have, those nagging questions about our spiritual security. I've noticed over the years, and people have asked that question, questions about it to me, the questions about spiritual security, how can I know that I'm right with God, they don't seem to come from people who are living in the gutter or on the verge of getting into the gutter. They come from people who are really, really striving to be the type of person that God wants them to be. Those who continually question whether they're, not, whether they're good enough to go to heaven, I think sometimes fail to realize their true position in Christ. And at the same time, some people look back to a life previously lived in sin, and they still find attraction there. I'd like to go back to that. I'd like to enjoy some of those old things. And so the temptation to return to an old sinful lifestyle can be great, especially if you do not consider the greatness of the freedom that we have in Christ. If you have known the destructive power of sin in your own life personally, then you ought to be able to appreciate the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. And so Galatians chapter 4 is going to begin with an illustration. He says in verse 1, I say as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So also we, while we were children, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. When the fullness of time come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And so I want us to think about this illustration here. Is an heir any different from a slave? How would we answer a question like that? Well, he says in the beginning of this text, as long as the heir is a child... He does not differ at all from a slave, though he is the owner of all things. Imagine, if you can, the crown prince. He is going to be king one day, when and if mama ever dies. He's born to royalty. One day he's going to be the sovereign. He's going to be the ruler of the empire. And that time at which he was a little child, well... He didn't have any freedom at all. He was under guardians. He was under managers. It doesn't become him and uh, become his until the time that has been set by his father. John Stott, who was an Englishman, uh, wrote a commentary on the book of Galatians. I think he did a great job of summing this up. 
he said that during his minority, although he is lord of all the, st the estate by title, yet he is no better off than a sermon, servant. He is put under guardians, under trustees, who act as his controllers, uh, the controllers of his person, the controllers of his property. They order him about, they direct him, they discipline him. He is under restraint. He has no liberty because he is the heir. He is, in fact, the Lord. But now while he's a child, he is no better than a slave. Moreover, he will remain in, in his bondage until the time that has been set by the Father. So he may be the owner of all things as a child, but yet he is still under restraint. That's a perfect illustration of what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, and uh, that's his illustration really of the Galatians. There was a time when they were children. Look at verse 3 of chapter 4. So also we... While we were children, we were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. One who is held in bondage in a, is a slave. In fact, held in bondage is simply an indirect way, sort of a roundabout way of saying that this person is enslaved. Well, to what have they, um, to what have they been enslaved? If you look at this verse, it says that they were enslaved unto uh, the elemental things. Some translations may say the fundamental, thing, fundamental things, the Greek words toikeia. What does that mean? Well, it refers to the elements of learning or uh, the fundamental principles. Before a first grade student can write a word, now that probably goes back. Not far enough, but it goes back in my experience. I learned to write, I learned to read when I was in the first grade. And kindergarten was not mandatory in the state of Alabama in the year 19, whatever it was. So I didn't go to kindergarten. My parents didn't think I needed it. It was not offered at the elementary school in our town. So I learned to read and write in the first grade. What did I have to learn before I could learn to read? What did I have to learn? The, who said ABCs? Okay, I had to learn those ABCs. I had to learn that alphabet. I learned in college, studying biblical languages, studying a language like Greek. I want to read the Greek New Testament. What have I got to learn before I can read a single word of Greek? I've got to learn the alpha, beta, gamma. I've got to learn the alphabet. And so you work and you memorize that very fundamental thing, that necessary thing, the alphabet. You can't read a word of English until you learn the alphabet. can't read a word of Greek until you learn the alphabet doesn't make you a special person if you can read Greek. If you can read and you can learn, you can learn to read it. Then I had the opportunity to learn to read Hebrew. And guess what you've got to learn before you can read a word of Hebrew? Well, you may have to learn a little bit more than you do to learn, a word, learn to read a word of Greek. You've got to learn to read in the right direction. Because we write left to right, Hebrews written right to left. And you don't find the beginning of the book until you open the back of the book. But to be able to read a word of it, you've got to learn the Aleph, Bait, Gimel. You've got to learn the alphabet. It's very learnable. It's not that difficult to understand, but you can't read a word of it until you learn to read it. Now, what are the stoicheia? What are the elemental things, the fundamental things? Well, before a student can write a word, they've got to learn to write the letters of the alphabet, the fundamental principles. Some biblical scholars see Paul's statement here as a reference to the law, and the law of Moses served as the fundamental principles. It can also refer to, and I quote, elemental things or and I quote, elemental spirits, 
heavenly bodies, that sort of thing. The idea of elemental spirits and even heavenly bodies causes one to think of paganism. Uh, there were a lot of pagan religions that lived in fear of spirits. They worshiped the heavenly bodies. Uh, in verse 8, he is going to refer to a time when they did not know God. They were enslaved to those things which by nature are no gods. And yet in verse 4, I think what he does here, and let's read verse 4, um, verse 3 and 4 again, um, uh, he, where he talks about being held in bondage unto the elemental things of the world. That's actually verse 3. And I think in verse 3, then understanding verse 4 and verse 5, when he talks about these elemental things, he is talking about the principles of the law. He goes on to say, when the fullness of time came, Christ sent forth his son born of a woman, born under what? Born under the law. So that it might redeem those who were under the law, that they might receive the adoption of sons. Because you are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So the elemental things there being um, the commands of the law of Moses, the Old Testament law, his reference to it here I think makes it pretty clear, at least to me, that when he talks about the elemental things in verse 3, he is talking about uh, the relationship to God as it had existed under Judaism from which we have been set free through the, call, the cross of Christ. And so they were previously enslaved to elemental things. One of the great words in the Bible begins Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. What is the first word of Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 in your Bible? But. What does that mean, Brother Eddie? But. Yeah. Now here's the way it were. Here, here's where you were. But. And the greatest but in all of the world is this one. But God. But God. Here expressed this way. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. Born of a woman, born under the law. So when the time came, when the time was just right, what is it <clears throat> that God is going to do? In fact, by the time uh, he writes the book of Galatians, God has already done this. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5 is really one of the most profound statements in all of Scripture about what God has done for us. When the fullness of time came, Previously, we were that child who was like a servant, but though we had been held in captivity to the fundamental things, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. His son was born of a woman. His son was born of a law, of the, under the law. He sent him forth so that he might redeem those who were under the law so that we could receive adoption as sons. That is a mouthful. When the fullness of time has come, the pleroma, if you will, and that is something that fills up something. Think about filling up a glass with whatever you're going to put into that glass. B, it can refer to that which makes something complete, the state of being full as in the fullness of time, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. When the fullness of time came, what did God do? Now, the fact that he's about to do something lets us know uh, what it means here in this verse, the state of being full as in the fullness of time. Let me put that to you another way. When the right time came, when the right time came, God sent forth his son. His son was born of a woman. His son was born under the law. There are a lot of ways in which Jesus came into the world in the fullness of time when the time was right. Um, the text we had to read many years ago in a, in a course at university called Church History began with a discussion of when Jesus came into the world, the times in which Jesus came into the world. Who ruled, who ruled the world when Jesus came into the world? I just answered the question, Rome ruled the world. 
well, that's bad. You got the Caesars, they're a bunch of bad people. They're going to wind up persecuting Christians, oppressing folks and all that. There was a lot of good thing. There were a lot of good contributions made by the Roman Empire. A lot of things in place in the first century made it just the right time, so far as the world was concerned, for the Son of God to make his appearance. You had a universal language. Greek was spoken just about everywhere. One of the contributions that Rome made to humanity during the time in which she controlled the world was an unbelievable road system. An unbelievable road system. I saw uh, a um, funny picture on um, Facebook the other day. It was from the far side. Did any of y'all enjoy the far side when it used to appear in the, in the newspapers? Maybe I'm the only one with that kind of twisted sense of humor. I love the far side. In this little picture, you've got the road. There are a bunch of huge potholes in the road. And there's a guy with a putter and a golf ball. And um, he's playing three-way golf. He's, he's putting the the, the golf ball into all those potholes. Well, the, the, the Roman system of roads that they built throughout the world, that might not impress us if we have traveled around this country coast to coast, border to border, on our wonderful interstate highway system. But it was a marvelous thing for the first century we talk about, oh, how difficult transportation was, and they walked a whole lot of places. We find a guy in the New Testament riding along in a chariot in the 8th chapter of the book of Acts, and, you know, the, the, the transportation was very primitive. We focus on that. We need to focus on the positive of that. What did that Ethiopian man have for his chariot? He had a road, and for the time it was a mighty good road. Universal language spoken everywhere, how easy is that going to facilitate the spread of the gospel? I didn't have any trouble preaching the gospel when I went to New Zealand. Everybody, well, nearly everybody spoke English. I spoke Alabama, but we were able to communicate, common language. Go to Jamaica. Everybody spoke the same language. We all spoke English. They had their own sort of pidgin language called patois that they spoke. They speak it amongst themselves and always made me uncomfortable when I'd be standing around two or three Jamaicans and they would start going to town in patois. You remember that, Brother Marvin? I couldn't understand a word of it. And I was just positive they were talking to each other about me and saying negative things, you know, look at this idiot standing here, who does he think he is? But we didn't have a language barrier. We could talk to people, same language. Now go to Nicaragua. It's a little different. I have to have a high level of trust because I have to speak through an interpreter. But I trust my interpreters, and they're going to do a wonderful job how valuable is it? How much more easily is it to communicate the gospel in the first century having a universal language? How much easier is it to get from one place to the other, even though their transportation is primitive compared to ours and though the roads would have looked nothing like ours, how much easier is it to get from Philippi to Corinth to Athens, so on and so forth, because the Romans have built a system of roads. And so Williston Walker in his history of the Christian church made a big point that when Jesus came into the world, conditions in the world at that time were just right so far as facilitating the spread of the gospel. I think they would be uh, right also in a number of different ways. Jesus' appearance on the world scene was not random, not random at all. God didn't 
just decide all of a sudden one day, days, months, years. It means absolutely nothing to God. He exists in eternity. But he didn't just decide one day. You know what? I've been planning to do this for some time. This would be as good a day as any to send Jesus into the world. He did it in the fullness of time. He did it according to his eternal purpose. And Paul says that when the fullness of time came, when it was just the right time, the conditions existed that God wanted to exist, it was according to his eternal purpose, he sent his son into the world. And what is said here of Jesus in Galatians chapter 4 in verse 4? God sent forth his son. What's the first thing he says about Jesus? He was born of a woman. Why does that appear to be an important thing, to think about him having been born of a woman? Now, that could seem to you to be a case of stating the obvious. I don't believe it is a case of stating the obvious. How was Jesus conceived? Was it a normal man-woman relationship? Or it was miraculous, conceived by the Holy Spirit rather than by Joseph, who was thought to be the father of Jesus, no doubt by some people, conceived by the Holy Spirit. Well, if you know that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit... You might draw all kinds of crazy assumptions. You might draw the conclusion that, well, he's, uh, uh, he's not really the son of God, or rather he's not really the son of man. He's just a divine being, but not a, a human being as well. <clears throat> if you want to identify who the Antichrist is, you can read 2 John verse number 7, where he says, Many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the Antichrist. In the writings of John, who is Antichrist? The one that says that Jesus did not come in the flesh. So why does <clears throat> Paul say he was born of a woman? to let us know that Jesus came in the flesh. A number of years ago, I asked a ladies' Bible class on Wednesday morning back at the old building, what is more important, that Jesus was the Son of God or that he was the Son of Man? Instantly, people began to say, Son of God. I said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What does John say about that? If he, he doesn't say, if you deny that he's the Son of God, you're the Antichrist. But if you say he didn't come, how? In the flesh. If you deny that, you are the Antichrist. So I, I, you know, what's more important, that he's the Son of God or the Son of Man? They're equally important. They're equally important. And if you say he didn't exist as a human being then no offense, Jesus, or John says, you're the Antichrist. So he was born of woman. He doesn't say born of man and woman. I think you can also just infer from that that he's son of God. Who is he? He's son of God. He's son of man. The Holy Spirit caused Mary to conceive and give birth to a son. And so he was born of a woman. Never forget that Jesus had a fleshly body. And that'd be a wonderful exercise sometime, be to spend about 30 minutes just looking in the New Testament at the implications of the fact that he came in the flesh. Read Hebrews chapter 2, starting about verse 14. Read what is said in the book of Hebrews in, in the discussion about our great high priest. We don't have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but one who was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Because we have 
the high priest who knows what it's like to be tempted, we can draw near to the throne of grace so that we can receive mercy, find grace to help in time of need. In Hebrews chapter 2 in verse 14, which is, man, it's just one of my favorite texts in the book of Hebrews, because we partake of flesh and blood. I'm going to read that verse to you. Therefore, since the children, that's us, since we share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same. What's the same? Flesh and blood. He himself likewise partook of the same. Why? That through death, that's the cross, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. How important is it that Jesus came, was born of a woman, lived in a fleshly body for the period of time in which he did? How important is that to our relationship with God, to our existence? So he was born of a woman. He was born under the law. What does it mean to be born of the law? If you read the gospel accounts, you'll find that this happened with Jesus he was circumcised on the eighth day. You will find that uh, after he was born, he was carried up to the temple for that circumcision. While there, there were sacrifices that were offered for purification, for marriage purification, because a certain number of days after um, you have given birth, according to the Old Testament law, there must be a sacrifice offered. So he was born of a woman. He was born under the law, conceived by the Holy Spirit, lived his time on earth as son of God and son of man, born of a woman, born under the law. When did all of that happen? At just exactly the right time, not at some random moment, not at some random occasion, but in the fullness of time, he sent forth his son. And by the way, to send out, that means to send someone away in order to fulfill a mission. Think about that as uh, an important part of this statement. Think about what Paul says in Acts chapter 22 and verse 21 when um, Jesus had told Saul from Tarsus, go for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Why did Jesus come to earth? God sent him. And that means that he sent him on a mission. The most important mission anybody has ever been given. He was sent to redeem those under the law, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 5, so that we might receive adoption as sons. He sent him. He sent him with a mission. That mission was to redeem us so that we can be adopted as sons and daughters of God. And that brings us to this wonderful point. If you were in Christ Jesus, go back to chapter 3, verse 25, 26, 27, really 24. The law was our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we could be justified by faith. Since faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. We're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ, how that happened is explained here. When it was just the right time, God sent him forth. He was born of a woman. He was born under the law. He came on a mission. The mission was to redeem those who were under the law so that we could receive the adoption as sons. What does it mean to be adopted? Adopted children, biological children, to me, they're one and the same. I don't have any adopted children, but I have, if I had adopted any children, that would be my child. I knew a person a number of years ago, a grandfather. You don't, none of you know him, so don't try to figure it out. It's time to give out some Christmas presents to his grandchildren. One of his grandchildren was adopted. He was giving them like $10 a piece. He gave the adopted son $5. Now, 
one of his children asked him about that. And you know what he said? Well, he's just adopted. When I heard that, I had no respect for that man any longer. No respect at all. What are we? We're sons and daughters of God. What type of spirit do we receive in verse 5? We receive the spirit of adoption. What that tells me is nothing negative about me. I knew somebody one time that when he found out he was adopted, he would have nothing else to do with his adoptive parents. He was upset with them because they had done that. I guess it would have been better to have let him roam the streets or something. If we have this spirit of adoption, if we're the adopted children of God, that means that God has selected us. He selected us. He made a decision to take us in, to make us his own. And so that's a wonderful statement to think about what is accomplished as a result of this mission that God gave to Jesus. And so he says in verse 6, you've received the adoption of sons. Well, because you are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now there's the first bell. I want you to think about that word Abba for just a moment. I don't know many people who refer to their biological father as father. My wife tells me about a friend of hers growing up that referred to her dad as father. She always thought that sounded like, man, that's kind of formal, that's kind of cold, that's kind of standoffish. I think we need to understand what father really means. Abba is an Aramaic word. If you took the first two letters, ab, or av, as it would be properly pronounced, that's an Aramaic and Hebrew word for father, for father. Abba is a little bit different. It's a word that expresses warmth. It's a word that expresses closeness. What would be a term of, that would, that would express warmth and closeness, just a fond affection that you would have used as a designation for your father? Now, we're scared to say it. Huh? That's what I called mine. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to come in here and I'm not going to bow my head and I'm not going to pray, Dear Daddy. You know, he's my father who art in heaven. But that is about as close as we get to what Abba means. That's about as close as we get to what Abba means. It's a term of expression. It's a term of fondness, of warmth. He has adopted us. We get to be his by our faith in Christ Jesus. That's explained in chapter 3, 26 and 27. And you know, some of my favorite words, oh, how great it makes me feel to go back in time, to come home in, late in the afternoon after work. And yes, we preachers do go to work. The fact that you may not see my car at a particular location doesn't mean I'm not working. But I come back and I open that door and there are little feet running across the floor. It's Daddy's home. How do you think that made me feel? You know, guys, because a lot of you have experienced that same thing. Daddy's home. I'm not saying call God Daddy. So don't leave here and go fuss. Well, he says God's Daddy. See, I told you we're afraid to say Abba. And we're singing in a song. Do you realize when you sing Abba, Father, do you realize what you were saying? A term of warmth, a term of affection, a term of fondness. And so that is what we cry in our hearts. And he says in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6, Because your sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wow. The fullness of time came when it was just right. 
God sent his son on a mission. Born of a woman, born under the law. Come back next week.